And now we'll have the reading from the Old Testament. Today I'll be reading Exodus chapter 19, verses 1 through 25. You'll find it in your pew Bibles on pages 56 and 57. Listen to the word of the Lord. On the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain while Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among the peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. And the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people of the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am coming to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you and may also believe you forever. When Moses told the words of the people to the Lord, the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their garments and be ready for that third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. And you shall set limits before the people all around, saying, Take care not to go up into the mountain or touch the edge of it. Whoever touches the the mountain shall be put to death. No hand shall touch him, but he shall be stoned or shot. Whether beast or man, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the, the mountain. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and consecrated the people, and they washed their garments. And he said to the people, Be ready for the third day, and do not go near a woman. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and very loud trumpet blast, so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. And they stood their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in a thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, And the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain. And Moses went up. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down and warn the people, lest they break through to the Lord to look, and many of them perish. Also let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves, lest the Lord break out against them. And Moses said to the Lord, The people cannot come up up to Mount Sinai, Sinai, For you yourself warned us, saying, Set limits around the mountain and consecrate it. And the Lord said to him, Go down and come up, bringing Aaron with you. But do not let the priest and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and told them, This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second scripture reading continues in the book of Exodus. I shall be reading chapter 20, verses 1 through 21. Again, let us listen to the word of God. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. 
You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Now, when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountains smoking, the people were afraid and trembled, and they stood far off and said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. Moses said to the people, do not fear, for the Lord has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. The people stood far off, while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. Friends, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May God add his blessing to the reading and to the hearing of his holy word. So I want to begin today by taking a poll, okay? By a show of hands... Who here today believes that we should live our lives according to the Ten Commandments? Okay, pretty much everybody raised their hand. Well done. Good job. That's the right answer. <laughs> We're doing great so far. So, since we all agreed that we should live our lives according to the Ten Commandments. Since we all agreed we should obey these commandments, I want you to open up your bulletins, and in the middle there's a notes section with some blank space. In your pews there should be pencils that are sharp, and I want you to take the next minute or two and from memory write down the Ten Commandments. Now, I just read them to you, okay? And I know we were all paying attention, so this should not be hard. Moreover, about three and a half years ago, I did this very same exercise with you. You hated me then, and I know you hate me now. But you've had three and a half years <laughs> to commit them to memory. So don't worry about getting all the words. Don't worry about getting them in order. Just write down as many as you can remember. Some of you are going back in time to Sunday school when you learned the song of the Ten Commandments. You're singing it to yourself. Don't shush me. <laughs> she shushed me. <laughs> so I'll give you another minute or so. Okay, 
how are we doing? We almost done? Give you another little bit here, another 30 seconds. I see giggling in the balcony, that's never good. Okay, so let's see how well you did here. You didn't have to name them in order, but we'll go through them in order for the sake of clarity. So number one, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. You shall have no other gods before me. Number two, you shall not make any graven images or representations of God. Number three, do not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Number four, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Number five, honor your father and your mother. Number six, you shall not murder. Number seven, you shall not commit adultery. Number eight, you shall not steal. Number nine, you shall not lie or bear false witness. And number 10, Avoid that terrible cancer of the soul that is envy. You shall not covet or desire what belongs to someone else and not to you. Okay? Who here got all ten? Well done. I see two hands up. Gold stars for Rita and for Terry today. Who got nine? A few more got nine. Eight? A few more. Seven? Those of you that got at least seven, congratulations. That's a C minus. <laughs> you passed. And the rest of you, you know you've got some work to do. So now that I've burned through all the goodwill that I had with you, because none of us missed pop quizzes from school, I know. The reason I went through this exercise is actually very simple. If we really believe that these Ten Commandments are important. If we really believe that we should be obeying them, if we really believe they should be a foundation for our society, if we believe they should be a foundation for our Christian faith, then we need to know them, right? How can we obey commandments and laws that we do not know. We need to think on them, we need to ponder them, we need to study them, we need to live them. So God gives us these commandments in a particular order. The first four commandments, or the first table of the law, as it is often called, deals with our relationship with God. Because, of course, our relationship with God is the foundation of our lives. It's the foundation for all of our other relationships. It's, he is the source of life, period, for us. So we have to begin with our relationship with him. And at the very beginning, God makes a claim of exclusivity with us. He says that we must have no other gods but him that he is the one and only God, and that he's not willing to share us with any other deities or any other priorities or anyone or anything else in our lives. Now, already we can feel the pushback from the world, right? Because the world does not like exclusive claims like this. The world does not like a claim to an exclusive truth. We live in an era of what I like to call salad bar spirituality. You know, at a salad bar, you take a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and you toss it together, and you've got your own unique salad that you created with you. That's how a lot of people treat their spiritual lives today. They craft their own spirituality, taking a little bit from here, there, and everywhere. A little bit of yoga, we'll borrow that from Hinduism. A little bit of astrology, we'll borrow that from old-fashioned paganism. A little bit of Zen, Buddhist meditation, throw in the Christian love thy neighbor, because who can resist that? And lo and behold, I've crafted a new spirituality that 
feels true for me. It may not be true for you, but it feels true for me. It feels good for me. And of course it feels good for you because you've just created a God in your own image who will never disagree with you. Of course that's going to feel good. But God here at the very beginning says, no, you don't get to define who I am. I am the Lord your God, and you shall have no other gods but me. We must submit to him and worship him. And that's unfashionable today, and that's unpopular today. But if you read through the history in scriptures, God has never really cared about our fashions. And he's never really cared about winning any popularity contests. Besides, throughout the Bible, we're also told that if you want to be a wise person, and wisdom, according to the Bible, is to be skilled at living your life, living your life well, living the good life. If you don't want to flunk life, in other words, if you want to be a wise person, it begins with keeping this commandment. The fear of the Lord, Proverbs says, having a proper reverence and awe and worship of God is the necessary first step on the path to wisdom. If you get that wrong, you will not be wise. That's what the Bible says. So it begins with worshiping God and worshiping him alone. And then we see in the second commandment that God is particular about the way that we worship him. He says, you shall not make any pictures of me, any images of me, any statues of me. You shall not make any physical representation of God or bring any earthly image into your worship place and bow down before it. Presbyterians historically have always, always taken this second commandment very seriously. And if you go into any of the churches in our presbytery, particularly if you go into an old Presbyterian church like ours, you'll find the sanctuary tends to be very plain, very stark. And there's two reasons for that. Number one, the focus of what happens in this space is what we're doing right now, the reading and the hearing of the Word of God. And nothing, according to our Presbyterian theology, should get in the way of that, not even the architecture or the decoration of the room. But secondly, the fact is Whenever you try to make an image of God, whenever you try to draw God or paint God or sculpt God or make a representation of God, you're never actually capturing the fullness of God's essence and being. You're capturing what you believe God is like. And so by definition, the end result is going to be an idol. It's not really going to be the Lord that you have depicted. It's going to be your version of the Lord. And before any of us get into trouble with bowing down and worshiping our image of who God is, God puts the kibosh on that and says, no, you shall not make any graven images of me. God also forbids, in the third commandment, the misuse of his name. We must not use it as a curse. Can you imagine anything more horrible than taking the name of God, our creator, our savior, and using it to curse? He says, you shall not casually swear by my name. Oh, I swear to God it's true nor shall you take my name and slap it onto your pet project and say you've got to do it because it's God's will. Unless, of course, it actually is God's will. And then be very careful. Fourth, 
God says, remember the Sabbath by keeping it holy. Now, here, <laughs> here in 21st century America, I think this is the commandment we ignore the most. And I think we've seen evidence of that, especially now during this time of pandemic, when so many people cannot go into work, when so many people are forced to be away from the office, to stay home, or they're laid off, or they're furloughed, and they find they have no idea how to live without being at work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They have no idea what to do with themselves. God says we must set aside time each week, literally schedule time each week for rest, for worship, and simply to enjoy the blessing of life that he has given unto us. Because life is more than work. Our lives are to be defined by more than what we do. And even God took time to rest after making the world. Who do we think we are that we should have an exception to that? Yes, 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 God, but you don't understand. I'm very busy and important. I shouldn't have to take time to rest. That seems like a waste to me. I don't know how to be still and do nothing. And God says, learn. Because you need to set aside time to rest and to worship and to play. And by my experience, if you don't set aside that time and you push yourself 24-7, pretty soon God's going to see that you get that time of rest, but it's going to be in a sickbed as you work yourself into illness. And then you won't like how he enforces that time of rest. Besides, God says, you were once slaves in Egypt. And it's only slaves that are forced to work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And God says, I will never allow you to go back into that slavery lifestyle again. Remember the Sabbath by keeping it holy. So then, after those first four commandments, after that first table of the law, as it is called, God then turns to the uh, last six commandments, which deal with our relationships with each other. If you want to sum them up, the first four, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The last six, love your neighbor as you love yourself. But we begin with the first relationships that we have in our lives. The fifth commandment, honor your father and your mother. Now notice, God didn't say worship your father and your mother. God didn't say put your father and your mother up on a pedestal. God didn't say blindly obey your father and mother and never, ever, 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 ever question anything that they tell you. God says honor your father and your mother. That's completely different. It's still difficult for many of us who may have grown up with a father or a mother who was not particularly honorable. That's when it really gets difficult to keep this commandment. But notice, God doesn't give us any wiggle room. He doesn't say, honor your father and your mother if it's convenient, if you feel like it, if that seems like a good idea for you. He says, no, honor your father and your mother. And he doesn't give us any wiggle room on any of the other commandments here either. He says no to all kinds of behavior that kills relationships. He says no to murder, no to adultery, no to stealing, to lying, and to that terrible, terrible soul-killing envy of wanting what other people have and you don't. Seriously, that's an incredibly destructive sin sin of coveting. And remember, Jesus preached on these last six commandments in his Sermon on the Mount, and he took 
these six commandments that are stated in a negative, and he spun many of them in the positive as well. For instance, he says in the seventh commandment, God is doing more than forbidding the specific physical act of adultery. In the positive, God is upholding the standard of marriage as a foundation for our society and saying what God has joined together, let no one separate. So therefore, Jesus says, if you even look at somebody whom you're not married to lustfully, that's the seeds of adultery. That's where adultery comes from. And so in God's eyes, it's almost the same as committing adultery. So therefore, watch what you do with your eyes. Similarly, in the sixth commandment, Jesus says, God is doing more than just forbidding the specific act of murder here, but that we are to treat each other positively with that divine selfless agape love. And so when you are angry with each other, Jesus says, that's the seeds of murder. That's where murder comes from, having such an anger and a contempt for somebody that you would be willing to do violence to a person created in the image of God. And in God's eyes, it's the same thing. God wants us to do more than avoid lying. We try to do all kinds of rhetorical gymnastics, don't we? Well, I didn't really lie, we say. And Jesus says, I want you to be the kind of person who is so honest that when you say yes, everybody knows you really do mean yes. And when you say no, everybody knows you really do mean no. In other words, we're to love each other in our words, in our actions, in our choices, as we love ourselves. We are to treat each other the way we would want to be treated if the roles were reversed. God spoke all these words. And we need to know them. And we need to study them. And we are called to live our lives by them. So I know we're all feeling really down and depressed right now, right? Because we don't live by these commandments, do we? As much as we piously say, yes, we should all live our lives by the Ten Commandments. Yes, our society should be founded on the Ten Commandments. We don't live them, do we? Not really. So let me again remind us all of the good news. We are not called to keep these commandments in order to gain God's love and favor. No, we are called to keep these commandments because God has already given us his love and his favor through Jesus Christ. Jesus has already kept all of these commandments perfectly in our name, on our behalf. And he gives us that goodness and that righteousness as a free and perfect gift. He, when, when God looks at us, if we're in Christ, God sees the perfect goodness and righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ. That burden of guilt that we're feeling, that burden of shame we're feeling, Jesus lifted that from us and he dealt with it at the cross. It's in gratitude, therefore, that we learn these commandments and study these commandments and keep these commandments. It's in a profound thanksgiving to God for the incredible goodness and love that he has shown us that we therefore strive to keep these commandments. And even if we don't get it right all the time, we don't have to despair because we know in Christ there is forgiveness. So don't read these commandments and hear condemnation from God. If God is convicting you on something, by all means, listen. If God is saying, you need to work here on this one, by all means, pay attention. But the reason we read and study the law today is because we are so grateful to God for the gift of Jesus Christ that we want to live our lives to please Him. And... In addition to that, we strive to live our lives according to these commandments because this is also our witness to the rest of the world, right? 
Remember in chapter 19, which Bev read for us, that incredible chapter about God thundering from on high and the sounds of the trumpets and the flash of the lightning and the earthquake and all that was going on on Mount Sinai. God thundered from on high that his people were to live before him as a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Remember, a priest is the one who makes the connection between God and us possible. The priest is the one who bridges the gap between God and us. In our Protestant tradition, we We all are priests. Jesus is the great high priest. Jesus is the one who makes that connection with God truly possible. But Jesus also sends all of us out into the world in his name, in his authority, to help other people make that connection to God. God still wants us, his church, to be a kingdom of priests in the world. God still wants us by our testimony and by our reverent behavior to win other people to Christ so that they can know his grace and love and forgiveness. God still wants us to go into the world to overcome evil with good. And oh my goodness, doesn't the world need that today? Does our world not really desperately need the people of God to go out into the world and overcome evil with good in a world where people are so desperately terrified to leave their houses because they might get sick as if that's the worst thing that could happen to anybody. A world where we actually have to remind each other that, yeah, white people and black people do matter. Can you believe it? In 21st century America, we actually have to remind ourselves that white people and black people and every other kind of people are created specifically in the image of God and are beloved by him. And therefore, racism of any kind is profoundly wicked and evil and is not to be tolerated in the church. That we have to remind people that rioting and stealing and killing and destroying is wrong. And that people are pushing back and saying, no, it's the right thing to do. This is the world we live in today. In this crazy mixed up world, what would it be like if we, the church, actually took these commandments seriously? If we committed to live a different way in the world? What would it look like if we gave these commandments more than lip service and actually lived them out? What would it look like if we put God first in everything? If we said, I'm not going to put me as number one. I'm going to make God number one in my life. What would it look like if we didn't work ourselves to death, drive ourselves to an early grave because we refuse to learn how to rest? but instead took a day each week for worship, for enjoyment, for relaxation, to give thanks to God for the gift of life and all of the blessings he's lavished on us. What would it look like if we actually scheduled Sunday around worship and didn't just say, well, if I can't find anything better to do, then I guess I'll go to church. What if we really honored our parents no matter what? What if we really loved each other and didn't tear each other down with gossip and with lies and with spreading rumors and with backbiting and grumbling and complaining? What if we used our words to bless rather than curse? What if we really committed to loving our spouses, even when they annoy the snot out of us? But we say, I'm going to love you no matter what. What if we refused to take anything that did not belong to us, even the sugars on the tables at the restaurant? Well, they're not on the tables anymore, but when they put them back, or the paper clips at the office? What if we refused to take anything that did not belong to us? What if instead we had reputations for being the kind of people that you could hand your wallet to us, and when we give it back, everything will be in it? And we won't take anything that didn't belong to us. What if we told the truth all the time, 
lovingly, graciously, what if we told the truth no matter what? The world would think that we are freaks, and we would be in our world today. But you know what? The world would also be fascinated. The world would pay attention because in a world where everybody puts themselves first, it is a fascinating thing to see somebody who puts somebody else first. Do you remember when the man went in and shot up the Amish school and the Amish families came out and said, we forgive him and we forgive his family and we invite them to the funerals and we want to bless them? The world couldn't figure it out. Why on earth would they do that? They saw Christian love and grace and forgiveness and they didn't know what to do. In our world, if we do that, it utterly flabbergasts everybody. It has done so all through the history of the church. In the first centuries of the church, the Romans could not figure the Christians out. They did crazy things. They took care of the poor. Who ever heard of such a thing? There was no social security in the Roman Empire. If you were poor, that was your problem. Obviously, the gods were against you, or you were dumb or stupid, or had made bad choices, but that's on you. The Christians came and actually fed the hungry and clothed the naked and took care of the poor, and the Romans couldn't figure out why anyone would do that. They can't pay you back. Why would you do that? In a time of epidemic, the Christians went and took care of the sick and built hospitals and clinics. And the Romans and the rest of the world said, why would anyone do anything that stupid? Flee to the hills. Get away from the germs. Lock yourselves away. Don't go down and help people who are sick. You could get sick yourself and die. And a lot of Christians did. And the world went, what are they doing? The little babies that the Romans threw away because the fathers didn't want them. The Christians went and gathered them up and raised them and founded orphanages and blessed them. And the world said, why would you do that? Why would you commit all of that time and money into a baby that nobody wanted? Why? And it was attractive because eventually some of them at least realized you must be serving a great God who is giving a great love to do something like that. What if we today, by our priestly behavior, testified still to this great God that we have and the great love that He has given to us as salt and light in our world? For God spoke these words. And He's still speaking them today. Are we listening? To God alone be the glory. Let us pray. God, we thank you for your Ten Commandments and the incredible challenge that they are to our lives still today. Lord, they're so basic. We teach them to our children, and yet we still struggle with them in our lives. As we prepare to come and again feast on your body and your blood and your grace, we pray that you would strengthen us so that we indeed can go into the world and keep these commandments and bear witness to your greatness so that many would come to know and love you and so that we might overcome much evil with good. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.